1996, the new commissioner of corrections in Georgia, a fellow by the name of J. Wayne Gardner, started out his term with the stated goal to make the prison experience so unpleasant that when inmates were released, they would not wish to return. One of the vehicles for him to make their experiences so unpleasant was he was going to make sure that everyone dug ditches and then filled them in again. Like you hear people joke about that, but in the 90s in Georgia, that's what you did evidently if you were in prison. You dug ditches and filled them in again. Can you imagine the calluses you would have from digging and digging and digging for years? I know a fellow west of here, about two hours west of here, that uh, built his family's home. He dug the first spoon, uh, spoon full, shovel full, and uh, then he poured the concrete, framed it in, put up the drywall, painted it, electrical, plumbing, I mean, amazing fellow. He obviously, he's a contractor, but he, uh, he built the home for his family to live in. And when I shake his hand, I always feel some, very impressed because of the calluses on his hand. Because he is obviously someone who has worked and worked hard for many, many years. Now, if you go up to someone and shake their hand and you notice they have calluses, you would have no way to know off the top of your head whether they had calluses because they happened to be imprisoned in Georgia in the late 90s, or whether you were talking to a carpenter who had built his family a home. It, but you know there's a big difference there, right? Because you can have the same calluses, yet the reason you have them comes from a different purpose, if it, a different reason. And, and so we've been talking about suffering and the marks of suffering these last weeks. We started out by talking about the suffering from our own poor decisions. We, last week we talked about the suffering that's just what you have to do to run the race, what you have to do to get up and get moving. And today we're going to be talking about suffering as Jesus suffered, suffered for the love of another. And when it comes to suffering in this context, the intention matters. There is a vast difference between the calluses of forced labor and the calluses that you earn through your loving your family, building them a home. And what Jesus suffers is far more like that carpenter. He suffers because he, he came to love. And so Jesus did not come to suffer. Jesus came to love and then suffering what was a consequence of that. And to understand how this, this tight connection between love and suffering, we, I want to take a minute to explore something many of us have experienced. Parenthood. Right? Love and suffering rarely get so close as when being a parent. We love our children, we work for their good, we work for their future, and we make sacrifices for them. For example, how much sleep is sacrificed to a child? Right? You don't chime in, sorry. That, uh, <laughs> they, try, they wake up because they're hungry, they wake up because they're scared, they wake up because they woke up in the middle of the night and then they get in bed with you and there isn't enough room in the bed, especially if the cat's involved and especially if you have to have a body pillow because you're recovering from surgery and not just, just for example, for instance, right? And how many hours of, of sleep do you sacrifice out of love for your children? It's part of being a parent to make sure your children's needs are met, even when it hurts, even when it is uncomfortable. This continues far, far past when children are infants. Parents work second jobs to provide opportunities for their children. I know of people who are working second jobs so that their children can be involved in extracurricular activities which cost way too much and more. That's a different sermon. But uh, if our children need something and we can provide it, we'll do so even if it hurts. Which is not to say that we can, do, we can prevent children from suffering any pain whatsoever. Uh, my youngest, Fletcher, at three, is the exact height of our kitchen counter. I can't prevent him from suffering from running into the counter. He's just going to have to learn that. And he hasn't hit the counter again recently, so I think he's getting there. But uh, my daughter has gone to school this last year, and there, that has its own travails. I cannot prevent all of my children suffering, and, nor should I. But even if we haven't experienced it personally ourselves, we understand that parents love their children 
And sometimes that leads to scars and calluses. Sometimes that leads to suffering. But it is done for a purpose, and that's what makes it possible, right? It is done for the purpose of loving uh, our children, and that purpose makes the suffering worth it. That's what I think about when I'm trying to understand and explain what it means for Jesus to come and to love us. How, how does Jesus' love relate to his suffering? Jesus loves us first. Jesus wants what is best for us and is willing to do what it takes to make that possible. And in the end, that did bring him to suffering. Jesus came so that he might walk with us. That he might show us a better way to love his neighbor, to heal his neighbor, to care for folks. And when he suffered as a consequence of this, remember, he was run out of his hometown. He didn't say, that's it, I'm done. No, he kept on serving. When his disciples disappointed them and frustrated him, which they did, he didn't walk away and be done with them. He had patience with them, which is the same patient every... How much patience does a parent have for his or her children? How many times do you explain the same thing? Right? It's that patience born out of love. This way of life, of doing what is best for a neighbor, leads to a confrontation between Jesus and those who would oppress the neighbor, oppress folk. And uh, when that gets to the point where he's going to be uh, convicted, tried, crucified for that... He doesn't walk away from that, but he takes on that suffering. And if you've ever wanted to just kind of take a moment and conceptualize what type of suffering is involved in crucifixion, I'd invite you to look at your bulletin. What you're seeing in the bullet, your bulletin cover, we found this in this last century. This is a first century Jewish uh, heel bone. It was in a sepulchre uh, that had a, a Jewish, uh, all the bones from a Jewish body, uh, someone buried. And you'll notice that there's a nail through it. That's a Roman nail, right? Crucifixion. If you ever wondered what it looks like, that, that's one way to think about it right there. That's the suffering that Jesus did not shy away from. He didn't come to suffer, but out of love for us, he was willing to even endure that. <laughs> Jesus loves, and this love, this working for what is the best for others, led to his suffering, and it led to the promise with the cross is not the end. It leads to the resurrection. The resurrection is the promise that it's worth it, that love of neighbor in the end is vindicated, that when, another one, uh, that when love of another leads to suffering, it does make a difference. That Jesus loves us enough to suffer is rooted in a love that I dare say is deeper than the love of any of us for our children, for we love our children. Right? You ever struggle to love someone else's children? <laughs> I have a family member who once told me, you know, Andy, I love my children. Everyone else's children, I'm kind of iffy on. God loves everyone's children equally. Right? The person who frustrates you and annoys you, God loves that person enough to suffer for them too. When Jesus says that to love God and to love neighbor are the, what is most important, this is the type of love we're talking about. It's not a general fondness. Like, I, I love it when the kids run in the sprinkler down the street. It's so nice to watch the kids play. I love having a neighbor who uh, I can borrow tools from. Like, that's, that's, that's not really love. That's being fond of. Like, that's being happy for, right? What Jesus is talking about here is a love that is, is actually what I would call passionate. And, and uh, the word passion comes from the Latin word passus, which means to suffer. Like if you think about passionate, what passion, if you are passionate about something, you're willing to suffer for it. That, that's the type of love we're talking about here. A passionate love. A love that is willing to suffer. This is why that movie by Mel Gibson called The Passion of the Christ was called The Passion, because it comes from the word suffer. The suffering of Jesus for us. And so the love that Jesus is talking about having for our neighbor, this passionate love, seeks out the best for another, even if it might lead to suffering. And it is interesting to ask, who are you willing to suffer for? Who are you willing to suffer for? How long is that list? Because the people you are willing to suffer for, that's the people you can truly say that you love. Now, I do need to be very clear about a, a distinction here. There's a difference between choosing to love my neighbor, whether that neighbor has the same last name or is down the street or lives a world away, whoever it is, and, choose, and, and abuse, 
right? To say that I suffer because of the love for another is, is, is okay. To suffer because I love someone, like that, that gets dicey. And um, far too many times the church has told people, usually wives, to go back to a person who is hurting them. And that's not loving your neighbor, that's condoning abuse. When we see, what we see in the love of our neighbor that is healthy is... is we're telling the truth, right? I'm loving someone, and, and there's no lies built into that, right? I, abuse is built on the lie that a person deserves it, right? And, and so, uh, love tells the truth and expects and sees change and grows over time. Abuse is based on the lie that someone deserves to be hurt, and no one ever deserves it. So just to be, try to be clear about that, if there's any, ever any question, if anyone ever deserves to be hurt or insulted or abused, that, that's not loving your neighbor that's being abused. Okay, back to something a little bit more uplifting. I hate to address those buzzkill topics, but it's, it's there. To love your neighbor with a passionate love is to love them like they are family, to love them uh, as much as you love your own children, to seek out their good at all times. And I'm going to tell you the thing that gets in the way of this more often than anything I've come across. And to tell you about it, I need to tell you about a radio show. Who here has heard of Prairie Home Companion? Okay, some. Good. I appreciate that. Prairie Home Companion. It's the stories of Lake Wobegon, told by Garrison Keeler, when he would start every uh, story, the stories of Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average. Uh, he would start every story by saying, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, my hometown. And then he would tell a story of, of Minnesota, this town in, in Minnesota that it, it, it's... It's Shelbina with an accent. It, it's Midwestern. To, it's amazing. And uh, he tells, in the middle of one of these stories, he talks about a widower on a 4th, it, I believe it's on a 4th of July week. He's telling the story on the 4th of July. And he talks about this widower who is going to go out and make himself a, a hamburger. And uh, he goes out and gets the charcoal nice and hot. He puts his single hamburger on there, and he starts, he flips it once, he flips it twice, and, and he's learned something, because there comes a point when you're watching a hamburger on the grill when you think, I'll leave it on one more minute just to make sure it's done. All right, you all know that moment? And he has realized, it took him 80 years to realize it, that's the moment when you take the hamburger off the grill. The moment when you think, oh, I'll just leave it on just one more minute just to make sure it's done. That's the moment when the hamburger is juicy. Take it off and put it on a bun right then. Slap some cheese on it, call it good. All right? that, that thing that we tell ourselves because we're Midwesterners, but let me see if you identify it with any of these. You see someone moving in down the street and you think to yourself, I should go down and help. You know, but they probably have all the help they need and they don't want me getting in the way. Anyone, anyone hear, hear that, that voice talking to yourself? You see a mother struggling with uh, some kids and some groceries to get out to the car, and, and uh, you think to yourself, I should go over and give them a hand, but no, no, I don't want to embarrass them. Right? You think about having someone over for dinner, and it'd be a good time to have someone over for a dinner, but you know, they're probably too busy. Right? Y'all know what I'm talking about, that voice that gets real nice, right? that gets polite. You know, I just don't want to be in the way, I don't want to be embarrassing, I, I, they're probably too busy. Can, can you just ignore that for me? That Midwestern nice, can you just stop being so nice, please, and love on your neighbor? You walk down the street, and, and what this means is when someone offers that... This is the flip of it. We're, mid we're Midwesterners. So someone says, Can you need a, do you need a hand? What are you going to say? No, I got it. I'm just fine. How often are you lying? <laughs> yeah, someone offers help? You say thank you and accept it because they're trying to love the, your, their neighbor like Jesus Christ and, and you can accept that and let them be like Jesus. You're giving them a gift. I don't, here's another one. How often do you hear someone say, I just don't want to be a burden. I will, I will smack you in the name of Jesus Christ if I hear you say that. <laughs> Drives me crazy. We are here to carry each other's burdens. Don't you dare ever say that to me. I am here to serve you. We are here to serve each other. Don't be nice. Be Jesus for each other. Love on each other. Care for each other. And if it involves a little bit of sweat and a little bit of suffering, that's how you know you're loving each other. Don't be nice. Be like Jesus. Amen.